we're at 559. Should I go ahead and open? Sure. Okay, thanks. I'm just gonna quick peek, see what I look like, cause I'm just getting back from the gym. Amazing, <laughs> as always. <laughs> what was that, honey? I said you look, oh, wrong hun. I thought you meant me. <laughs> wrong honey. <laughs> You're cute, Jen. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Um, we're just going to give it another minute and then we'll get started with um, this evening's panel. Right, Meg, I think we'll go ahead and start recording and get going. Buju, Gikino Magani Dug, Jennifer Nimi, Indigena Kaz, Migazin Indu Dem, Gawa Bapi Kanika Gindunjiba, Idash, Two Harbors and Da. Welcome everyone to our fourth panel. Um, this evening, we're really excited about tonight. A little bittersweet that it's ending. Um, it, I feel like we've had a lot of great um, relationships rekindled, rebuilt um, in a time of COVID. So um, my name again is Jennifer Nemi. I'm the Director of Native Studies at the College of St. Scholastica. I also work with our Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Office. And just to share a little bit about our program, the recordings from our conversations, not only tonight, but the three previous panels um, are gonna become part of a school program um, through Friends of the Boundary Waters to highlight um, the importance of that natural resource and to um, highlight the importance of treaty rights as well. And the Boundary Waters is housed within the 1854 treaty um, territory. So this curriculum will be offered to both high school and middle school students in um, the Minnesota area. This project is a collaboration not only from the College of St. Scholastica, but between Friends of the Boundary Waters. And it's made possible through a generous um, grant opportunity through Heritage Partnerships programs. Uh, a grant is also funded through in part with the Minnesota Historical Society from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. So welcome everyone. Um, just as a reminder, if you have questions throughout the night, please use the Q&A um, portion and we'll make sure as best we can to get to your questions. We'll also be hosting, uh, Friends of the Boundary Waters will be hosting these conversations in full on their YouTube page as well. And we can share that information with you. But with that, again, welcome to tonight. I'm excited to have everybody back and I'm going to pass it on to Dixie. Buju, Niji, Nishinabidu, Gichibanesi Kwe, Indigo, Ojibwe Mung, Mayinga Nindu Dem, Galababi Gani Kog, and Junjimba. I am so pleased and so happy to be here tonight. I am the project coordinator for this project. Um, <clears throat> it's a curriculum project that highlights and um, shares Anishinaabe knowledge. Um, it's a way of indigenizing curriculum, bringing about our understandings of what we know and understand about the boundary waters, um, about the natural environments that we live in from our Anishinaabe perspective. Um, we have brought elders and um, community members to this board or this panel, excuse me, and we're very pleased to have you here with us tonight and look forward to hearing from you. Tonight's topic will be about hunting and gathering. Um, but a bit of an agenda of how things will go. Um, after I conclude, I will begin to introduce <coughs> the 
panelists for the evening. And then after um, the panelists are introduced, we will go into the prayer. Um, Gosh Bashkwe will be doing the prayer for us tonight. I have passed tobacco to her. In the interest of COVID and keeping everybody safe, we have done this over Zoom for that very purpose because we want to keep people healthy and not potentially getting COVID. So we ask that you grab tobacco um, and we'll give you time to do that right before the prayer. And if you hold the tobacco in your hand, um, you can hold it while she's conducting the prayer. And then after the prayer is done, we will give you a few minutes to take out your tobacco or do what you would do with it. Um, like I know Coco, she puts it next to her drum or at least she did before. So that's a little bit of what's gonna be happening tonight. And so with that, um, if we could get started with Coco, um, if you could tell us all about you, introduce yourself. She has her camera off. Do you wanna jump ahead and we'll come back to Nancy? Well, here I am. I just oh. went and got my tobacco. Okay, do you wanna turn on your camera? Ah, bonjour. Okay, my good neighbor, okay, my good big baby, my shanty go. Was just in the door, them, you can go to the minicarn and go on in don't you? After the game in the minute, and that way, he up my go away, they go be good, can not my gay or they go be good, can't the more. The Europe and again in by she which go on, she which I go away, they go gaga. The opportunity can't that way, no go much as in the guard deck. Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Nancy Jones, and I reside here at Nikki Gonsa Minikarning, and I'm an elder, and I am very happy to be among you guys. I'm happy to see people. I haven't seen people in two years, <laughs> only on Zoom. And I'm, uh, I'm really excited about um, the topic tonight. That's my one of my favorite Subjects is uh, food. Miigwech, <laughs> kinitam. Mugua, miigwech, Coco. All right, kinitam, Roxanne. Apo siya na entanoy magan nito. Buskwad mo ko ento ko. Wab si si ento din. Mas kasibin ento ang chupa. Oh, and don't you? And that's pretty much it. Huh? Just letting you know who I am and where I come from and my clan, and um, which are all kind of important things um, in the way that we introduce ourselves. Not only am I introducing myself to everybody else here but I'm, in, I'm i'm letting it be known to the spirit who it is that's speaking and um yeah there you go that way we we recognize affiliations between each other i i didn't realize that coco's dodem was was oh i have a, i have an auntie too yeah um i and so we, we listen for those little things hey as we make connections between us and i think that's kind of important um i just want to say thank you for having me um I think in the in the presence of Coco, I, I feel very inept sometimes, but I'll, I'll do the best I can to contribute what little bit I know. Miigwech. 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 Tell her, can you tell me? Slavakiash and Digo, Migizin do dem Miss Quabikang, Dunjiba, Daminama, Odawas, a Gaigani, Asian Kadego, or Nashanabe, Shkonigan, in Dayang, the wheel, the knee, John Sinanic Nish, Danoki, with the water could outing Asian Kadek, Miganin, when Wendaman, Gagwejimi Guyan, Madagagi, Gedoyan, the Widovimago, Gosa Gaykane, Dasujik, Bigwitch. My name is Keller Papp. I, um, 
I'm Manishinaabe from Red Cliff, Wisconsin, on the northernmost tip of uh, of Wisconsin mainland up that way. Uh, and I live at a place called Lakuta Ray, Dawaz Agaigan, with my wife and our children. Um, I work at a place called Wadukudari, which is a, an organization dedicated to the revitalization and vitality of Anishinaabe language and life ways and knowledge. And I'm happy to be here. Also, Miigwech, I really appreciate having the opportunity to sit with you all and uh, share our knowledge as Anishinaabe people. I am humbled to be with some of you. You are exceptionally talented people and uh, have many more years than I and uh, much more knowledge in so many unique ways. So it's an opportunity to learn as well and uh, respect our contributions of our knowledge here. So miigwech, miu. Oh, miigwech, kiminatagut. The Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission is in uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Michael Price Wasagizik. I am an Anishinaabe. I am Bear Clan. And my family's from Wequimacong First Nations at Manitoulin Island, Ontario. But I live here in uh, Wisconsin, Wishkong Singh. I just learned to say that not too long ago. <laughs> and I work for the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Now, miigwech. Miigwech. Great. Um, I'm uh, calling in live from uh, the southwest edge of uh, Lake Superior, where we're getting a little bit of a April snowstorm coming our way. Um, I'm from the Loon Clan. Um, I grew up on the western edge of, of Minnesota and consider uh, White Earth home, Gawababaganikag. I, I teach at the College of St. Scholastica and sit on the Native Studies Advisory Committee with uh, Jennifer Nimi. It truly is a, a humbling uh, experience to, to sit and uh, learn from each and every one of you in, on this panel. Miigwech. Oh, miigwech. Um, hello everyone, I am Lily and my clan is Bear Clan, and my family is from Redcliffe, but I live in Hayward, Wisconsin. And please excuse my cat. Miigwech. Miigwech. Can you tell me gosh, gosh, way? Uh, Buju. Um, hi, my name is Brooke. Um, I'm going to be doing the prayer tonight. Um, I'm Bear Clan. I'm from Redcliffe, and I live in Hayward right now. Um, and yeah. Miigwech. Oh, miigwech. All right, if everyone wants to take a 
moment or two, about a minute or so, get your tobacco um, and then come back and join us. Let us know that you're ready and we'll do the prayer. All right, it looks like almost everyone is back. Looks like we're just waiting on Allison and, oh, there's Lala Cash. Are you ready, Allison? All right. All right, Miss Josh Boshkwe, take it away. All right. Gosh, Boshkwe, Indigena Cause, Makun, Indudin, Squabicon, Indun, Jabba. Get you beneath the queen, keep me, or no, say, Manta. Ganu Damage and Nungum. Nui a puggis on Damoag a gil money do gain a board and all same. Naganas and money do me a money do got to the Kennege go on my king. Money do a yard on my king. Me a money do the we own Jenny Kate Ward a new initiative being the Nadamoad. Nudanun. No de noon when damn in luck, me and my be das in my beward, a widow wabuna, jawan on the gabinian, nago give it no. When a buju mirror out, money do net ham gagic no amoad, and a shanabin, a canagay go gain it, is it gain it? O commissan, a gay weed a yawan. Mita Gwabe Winini, me a uh, money do Ganakudang, me wanja the Ganawain dung, money do Ogitagan. Anish uh, Asa Nabe Winini, me a uh, uh, money do game, we do coad, a new in a shanabe, a ya cozenagen. Now a gizigna o de claimant, me go gaye, we know a cane o dapina. Wad ono seman and a so now a quay. Gedu damen nanig benesi benesiwag bemis sejig 
Gijigong Nayoka Dejig Awesi Awesiak Bibame Bitujig Migwayak Nibikang Ayajig Mimingwesu Wag Mi Inku Manidu Gwenda Jawena Majig Anu Nishanabe Abanu Jian Bagwajinin Mi Wao Manidu Ganakodang Mewanja the Gana Wendang Nagamona na Debajamoinan Anango Kageajig Gizu Wain and Mego na Neg Megua Nabayang We Mino Bawajigayang Gabibunake Me Aumani do Gooning Ayad Aginjibagwesi Me Aumani do Gaina Wendang Anishinabi Moin Jesus, me wa au mani du ga na kudang me wunja da zaka sada ni u nishinabe me guapi me kijik ga dinig. Divika Jesus, me wa au mani du ga na kudang me wunja da guayu ko sida moad in u nishinabe in gegu wani kene. Me me guiche. With Tagos, a Kinege Gu Ga Mina Goza Young and Ishinabe Weyang Nimigoicha Wainam Gaye Gagwe Jimigoyan de Gagi Gadoyan Gawin Nina Kena Mani Duke and Kena Masig Gawin Dash de Andres Krasin or Ausema Ewede Wainabe Ward a Kenegu Mani Duke Me and Ma is a Guayake Anne in a card. Get the same on me, right. We all want to take uh, about two minutes, two to three minutes, and go put out our tackle. All right, I need. Was a gizik in Nunda Winner? Nunda Winner, Michael, right? Yes. Hey, uh, did you find anything about those books? Yeah, our, uh, the guy who works in the public information office has been on vacation, so. Oh, so it's going to take a while, eh? Well, it won't be too long. Okay. Yeah, I'll find uh, out uh, something, and uh, uh, but I need to get your contact information from somebody. Yeah, I have a mailing address. I don't live in town. Okay. I have a post office box if you want to take it now. Oh, sure. Yeah, I got a pen and paper right here. All right, it's Nancy Jones. Uh huh. P.O. Box 404. Okay. 
Fort Francis, Ontario, Canada. Okay. P nine A a three M seven. That's my postal code. P nine A three M seven. Yeah, three Mary seven. Okay. Miigwech. No. Bonjour. Bonjour. Looks like we're just waiting for a couple people to come back. Oh. Now I think everybody is with us. Just waiting for Brooke and Lily to turn on their cameras. All right. Well, I'm really excited for this topic tonight, partially because Coco is so excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> uh, really honored to have everybody here talking about um, hunting and gathering. Um, and, you know, just hope that everybody can share, um, you know, as much as you can, and, you know, as much as you feel comfortable sharing. Um, because of course, you know, there'll be students and teachers um, potentially seeing these videos and learning from us and learning from our understandings of what we know about this topic. So as much as you are comfortable with, um, please share. All right, um, let's start with our elder, Coco. Would you please get us started? Uh huh. Oh, wow, bojo. Bojo, me now. How about you? Me now, and them. the man now. We see no one got me in the going. Got to see me in the going. See, I'm not no commission ban ning ni tawe ge ek ni go beja kon wen bo so ga ge ishe ni tawe ge ni ye ne ke ga ishe ni tawe ge an no penin ning ge aya i'm just so happy to be uh, to be included in this topic because that's one of my uh, my favorite topics because uh, just like uh, it's like when bo so i was raised by my grandmother and we lived in the bush in the tipi and we live off the land and uh I was raised on a trap line by my uh, grandma, and then after she passed, and then my mom and dad were uh, were on a trap line all the time. And then I don't know how it happened, but I ended up marrying a trapper. So I <laughs> I've raised my kids on uh, on a trap line too. All that uh, all that good food, and so I was a hunter for. Uh, a long time until I have to retire from the bush. Even when I was working at the school, I was still a weekend trapper and hunter. So um, now I'm uh, I'm teaching my grandkids, my great grandkids, about about hunting and uh, and harvesting the the animals that they catch. And I show them, I I told them to do it the proper way and just take what you need and don't forget your tobacco and 
teach them how. One one of the mistakes I made, though, one of my grandson is uh, just always get bring get me a deer, maybe two or three, and during the in the fall, and he'd bring it to my house and show, ask me to show him how to cut it up and how to skin it and how to debone it and everything. Him and uh, his nephew, my great grandson. So I showed him how. After a year. I showed them how they stopped coming. I said, what happened? Didn't you get a deer this year? Oh, I got them. Where are they? I skinned them. So I showed them how, and now they don't bring it to me anymore. <laughs> no, I, I am just kidding, but I am proud of them. Um, because one of the things that I was uh, told by my grandmother, the animals, the food in the bush is a medicine food. It, uh, our prayer mentioned that uh, how we healed is, uh, is what my grandmother talked about. Is uh, When we eat the food from the bush there, the animals that we watch them how they eat, we watch what they eat, and what they eat is the, what we make medicine out of. In fact, my grandmother used to take me to a, to a beaver house so we can watch the, the beaver getting his food, roots from the bottom and uh, the condomo i don't know what it is in english but that's uh that's his medicine that's the beaver's medicine and the, the beaver never beaver never gets sick and is always healthy and that's the, why these animals were put on here for us to to uh, to live and to 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 be well with there are a lot of a lot of things that we can use we can we can do with the animals right when like i said i trap i'm a, i'm a trapper and i married a trapper and then we uh, we raised our kids back in the bush before a residential school and then we always had all this um food way up north it's five portages away from nikki goes and Kaning, and we ported our our food all we took was a uh, flour lard tea oatmeal and the rest of the rest of the food comes from the bush and we always get a get a moose maybe two moose in a year there wasn't much deer up where we were but we always get a moose and then we get a moose because we don't have the refrigeration i always had a a way of preparing so that the food would last i smoke a lot of meat I made pemmican, noka iwagon, and what I didn't smoke, we put it in a gunny sack or burlash, whatever you call it, and then put it up in uh, up on a tree, so up in the wind, so the the meat will stay cold. If we want, if we want to, uh, we want to have um, fresh meat, and then I can a lot of meat, and I can meat will last oh I don't know, two years. So when uh, when I get we had we had five kids in the house before anyone ever started school because I I held back my my oldest daughter because they I didn't like the school that they were going to put her in so I waited till my son Don got old enough to go to school so they both went to school and we didn't have anything like um, no pop no chips no uh, candy so the the kids snack the, their snack was uh, the dry meat, the smoked meat, may, or um, maybe you can call it beef jerky, but it, but there was no chemicals in it, no, just a piece of stick of meat, and that's what they chew on when they were, when they, when they get too hungry before before meal time. And we always get lots of lots of food in the fall. We we uh, my husband, I was lucky enough to marry a good a good hunter. We, were, we used to shoot a lot of ducks. We carried a lot of fish, and we smoke all those. And the smoke, anything smoked, is last will last a long, long time, as long as you hang it up upon the tree and in, in the gun in the gunny gunny sack. I think we used to call it the gunny sack, uh, potato sack. And that's how we lived. We didn't need any. Uh, we didn't have electricity. We didn't have running water. But my kids were my running water, so. Uh, we were happy, and the kids would all learn about living off the land, 
and uh, before they went to school, they learn all about trapping, hunting, and skinning, and and then we make um, I made blankets for them out of a rabbit skin. You know how you you cut the rabbit skin into a string, and you make a wabu zekun out of that, and they're really really thermal warm, so they never got cold. So and never the kids are always outside, fresh air. For typically below out there, they're still playing out there. They're sliding and they're, they're happy. They got so used to the used to the weather because they when you live off the land, when you live outside, you don't even know it's 50 below out there. It's just not like today. I can I'm I'm cold. It's 50, 70 degrees in in my house. <laughs> but at that time, everybody was so. I think it was. Um, a nice healthy way to live is being outside every day. We learned to, the, the kids learn how to cut wood and haul water and just just about anything. If you watch um, Little House on the Prairie on TV, that's gone on now and then. And that's that's my life right there. That that's home for me. When I watch it, that's how we were. Everybody everybody's chipping for anything that we need to do. The girls knew how to cook right away. The girls knew how to sew by hand. So we were, uh, we did real, real well until they have to go to school. So, so I'm, I'm still that way, man. Like I said, I taught my, uh, my grandson and my, my great grandson to hunt. I have two, got two good hunters in my, in my life right now. Jason Jones, you guys probably know him, and Jalen is, uh, his, his partner is. They're real good hunters, and and I told them, and you, you better bring me that deer here, even if you cut it up. I want some of that. I said, I'm the one that taught you how to do that, so you bring it over here. But Jason likes your steaks, so I make steaks out of the the deer or moose. So he brings it over now, and that's all I'm going to say for now. Miigwech is in the way, and miigwech. <laughs> Miigwech, Koko. Megan. Can you tell me, Roxanne? Oh, gosh. You know, I, I think of that, I think of that movie, Benjamin Buttons, because there was a, <laughs> there was a phrase in there that kind of tickled me. Um, he said, you never know what's coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think that that's, that's kind of how my life was, you know, um, I don't, I don't know why it went the way it did, but I know that my mom did the very best to get us away from the vets. I know that my mom did the very best. She really wanted us to blend. Grandma didn't want to speak none of her language. She was too worried about, you know, what had happened to her and to her relatives. And so um, they did the best they could to pull us away. And um, yet it's funny. I was the only one who went with my uncles and I would, I would be back on the res regularly. And, um, you know, I was a kind of an obnoxious kid. I was always nosy and always hanging around. And so they hauled me with them and I, I you know, I was really energetic. And um, the only thing is, you know, uncle liked having me along to walk the trap lines, but he said I was rackety as hell. So. <laughs> From Roxanne, it went to rackety. That's what he called me as a kid. <laughs> but, I, but I did learn how to um, quiet down here because um, we had to be quiet, and, you know, especially, and I would go hunting with them. And, um, you know, I, I did learn how to be quiet and I learned how to do many things as a result. But I think, um, you know, my uncle's greatest gifts to me were, were letting me tag along. And like I said, you never know what's coming for you. Um, I think I'm the only one that um, you can literally throw. And, and Coco, I know you know this too. You can literally put anything on the table and I can dress it out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I learned, I had to learn how to do that. You know, mm -hmm. my uncles, I mean, we were really poor too. So even when, you know, my dad moved my mom out to a farm and he would, he would, I, goodness, we had groundhog. <laughs> I'm mm. telling you, I can dress out anything. You know, I've dressed out porcupines and 
groundhogs and squirrels. Oh my goodness, I don't even know how many squirrels. <laughs> you know, coots. Oh my god, you know, so I mean, one extreme to the next. Um, all the animals came and and somehow I was always standing there and I was always asking questions. And the next thing I know, I was the one with the knife in my hand, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I think I was really young when I first started helping my uncle. I think I was only, and isn't that funny? I don't know that I would put a knife in my granddaughter's hand. <laughs> and she's 15. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we just, we had to learn early, you know, same with cooking. I learned to cook early. Um, but I have to tell you, those are those are the best best memories of my life. Even though it was really hard, I remember I remember the snow being so deep, and and my mm. uncle, you know, making little little snowshoes for me. And oh my goodness, I had such a hard time with them. I, I remember that. I remember how many times I was falling down and you know, tripping over my feet, and I couldn't get the rhythm of it. And he'd say, "Watch, watch. You just there's a rhythm." You just get, it. <laughs> and I said, oh, oh, okay. He said, sing a song. <laughs> and, and it worked, you know, but I remember all kinds of crazy little things. And then I did the same thing to my children that my mother tried to do to me and what she did to the rest, you know, um, not wanting them to work hard, not wanting them to have to go through, you know, um, going down to the creek and hauling water. Uh, and that was a normal thing in the winter time. We always had to haul our water, so we'd go down to the creek. And isn't that funny? I don't know a creek that I would drink water out of now, except yeah. when we were in when we were in in New Zealand. There was a mountain creek that they drank out of, and I thought, oh, I miss that. Being able to reach right down into the creek and be able to drink it, and not worry. You know, I don't know that I would do that now. So, so when I think of hunting and gathering, you know, there, there were so many things that were the most meaningful parts of my life as far as being and connecting to Bin Shanabe. You know, that, that being out there, there's just simply nothing more beautiful than the smell of Bad River in the springtime. There, there's a smell. Okay? It's cedar, it's mud, it's... <laughs> because it's a swampy country you know um in the winter time the the quiet or or being close to the lake and and if the if the lake is for hearing it hearing it creaking and crack i mean there's so so many memories for that day that um yeah you just never know what's coming for you so nowadays i'm the only one I, i'm the only one who knows I, I tried to show my son as he got a little older, but eh, just not so interested. Um, I remember him dropping his first deer though and how excited he was to bring it home and how excited he was, you know, to, to stand over me as I was cleaning it and, and to show him and how excited he was to give it away, you mm-hmm. know, cause he gave away the whole thing. He said, mom, I know if I give away the whole thing, I'll always be able to come back. That's right. That's the way. That's the way my uncles talked about it. You know, you you give it away. And and so you know, I, I in some ways I feel really bad that I didn't expose them. You know, but now every opportunity, there every chance that I get, if there is a chance, because not as much. Like like Coco said, they don't come by as much now because you show the ones who are interested, and they're off doing it on their own. Yeah. You know? But, but funny things, you know, even, even um, I have people call me for things like, um, Auntie, can you help me with this eagle? Sure, bring a by, will. I'll help you work it, you know. And, and so there's, I, I, I know all kinds of weird stuff, <laughs> you know, and I, and, I, and I really think about, you know, how it is that my life went. And so I'm, I'm trying to be just a little bit more intentional now. And and keep my keep my grandchildren a little closer and show them more. Um, but in that way, I'm really sad. I think I really miss something. I, I really miss something in not showing them. Yeah. Never too late. I know I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. But Maybe you know, it's funny. 
My one granddaughter, oh my goodness, we were cleaning her dad's deer. And I swear she was up to here. <laughs> <laughs> so that, you know, so we tease her about that. And now she's, she's interested. There you um, go. But I worry that there won't be anybody else in the family, you know, if, if who knows what's going to happen, you know, um, maybe we, we're going to have to be able to take care of ourselves that way. And um, I think it's important that they at least understand the importance of working with that animal and talking to it in a good way and, you know, letting it be known that um, you'll waste nothing. We used to waste nothing. We boil up the bones and, you know, um, use it, um, boil up the, the hoofs. My uncles would use that for making, you know, particular kinds of, of adhesives. And I mean, they have shh, everything, everything was used. Mm-hmm. You know? So I'm, I'm really grateful for that what I got, I, I'm going to do, but I think you're right, Coco. I got to be a little bit more intentional about making sure them kids see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Miigwech. Oh, miigwech. Miigwech. <clears throat> oh, um, when I was, uh, Oh, I've got an echo here. Yeah, you got a loud voice. <laughs> How is that? Okay. I'm not I sure think... we're... Is it okay now? Okay. Yeah. When I was a young boy, I, I didn't grow up in uh, Ojibwe country. I grew up in southeastern Oklahoma. I grew up in Choctaw country. And as I was growing up, uh, when I went to school, there, everybody thought I was Choctaw. <laughs> And I'm like, no, my mom told me that we, my mom told me that we are Ojibwa and Odawa. And <clears throat> nobody in Oklahoma knew what that meant. And really neither did I either at that time. I think I told you one of the other uh, uh, sessions that my mother went through nine years of residential school and she lost her language. She lost her identity and, and, and her knowledge as an Anishinaabe woman. So she didn't, she didn't really have, wasn't able to teach me anything when I was young. <clears throat> but I learned how to hunt and trap from my dad's family and we lived very rural and uh, you know we hunted for food as well and I remember uh, going out and killing squirrels killing rabbits and I'd bring it back and, and my grandmother would, would cook them for us and I was really proud of that <clears throat> but as I got a little bit older um, something happened to me I, uh, I started killing for fun instead of for for food <clears throat> and just killing animals, any animal that come across my path. And I remember one rainy November day in Oklahoma, <clears throat> I was walking through the woods and I seen something white in the woods in the forest and, and, and I went towards it. And uh, it was an albino raccoon. Wow. I'd never seen one like that in my life. And the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to kill it. And I wanted to bring it home and show my family and make them proud of me. And so I did. I, I tracked that raccoon down and killed it. I brought it home and everybody was amazed because nobody had ever seen an albino raccoon before. <clears throat> and they said, hey, you should skin it out and get it, get it mounted. And so that's what I did. I was only like maybe 14 years old. I was sweeping floors after school to get a little bit of pocket money. So I swept enough of floors to pay for that, that raccoon to be mounted. <clears throat> and I got it back in four months, set it in the house. I was so proud of it. <laughs> and then as the years went by, all of a sudden that, that, that raccoon began to haunt me. I began to think about it. And I began to think about how beautiful it was out in the forest and how I tracked it down and, and killed it just because it was beautiful. And that raccoon haunted me for God, 20, 25 years. I, I still think about that, that animal. <clears throat> well, 30 years later, here I am, I'm, I'm learning the Anishinaabe language and I'm learning how to speak and I'm learning all these different words and I'm learning how beautifully complex the Ojibwe language is. And I came across this one word, and the word was nitage, nitage. And it means, you know, to kill something for food. 
But it also has another meaning too. It means to mourn the death of a loved one. And so I, I, I thought about that and I thought, wow, to kill something for food, to mourn the death of someone, all wrapped up into this small word, nitage. And <clears throat> I had to reflect on that for a long time. And then actually, after reflecting on that word, I began to think about why I felt so bad killing that raccoon, you know, so many years ago when I was a teenager and how that stayed with me my whole life. And by learning this Ojibwe word, Natage, it helped me to, to, to reconcile. And, and, and I realized that I didn't grow up. Nobody taught me any values about hunting. Nobody taught me that there's a ceremony to do and that you need to, you, you need to align your, your heart and your mind together when you go out and you take the life of an animal for your own, for your own survival. You know, I didn't have any of those, those spiritual teachings with me. I just went out and just killed whatever. So um, I think about that, that raccoon a lot. And when I finally sold my grandfather's place, that raccoon is still in the, in the, uh, in this big kind of cabinet, glass cabinet. And they asked me if I wanted it. And I'm like, no, I need to, I need to let it go. <clears throat> so I, Went through a, a period of anger where I, I didn't. Ha I, I was mad that I didn't grow up learning my my traditions and my language, you know. And then, then the residential school. So I went through a period of my life where, where I was pretty angry. The way I got rid of that anger was by learning my learning to speak the language and learning my culture, learning my traditional ways, going to the lodge, and that that really healed me on many different levels. But it, that. One experience took me all the way back to my hunting and trapping days. And I want my son to know how to, to, to hunt a deer, but I want him to learn those values. I don't want him to learn like I did. I want him to have the knowledge of the ceremonies and, and the, the knowledge of the spirituality uh, before he begins to take that, the life of that deer. I want him to humble himself and, and to not take joy in the killing of that animal, but to to realize that it's part of a sacred you know, cycle of life that we're a part of. And so that's what I wanted to share with you tonight. Naho, miigwech. Ho, miigwech. Miigwech. Let's take a look. Naho, kinetam, balokehash. Oh, miigwech. Gawin dash ni ni gij in itawi gusi ni o pane ba wiji waga wia ne taki o seid besho go che o denang sa gi taji gi kino magos. Aya pigo dash gi jam ne wode eshkoni gani gawin jibad ni mama wode miskwa bikang ish kadeg. Me would dig a wab magwa den away maganak, Kakio sewad, Kagigo kewad, Beshogo gichigami. Nimenjamanima kono kumis pane de jikwad no sa ma boozud. Bebung Minua Misago alga kikino maoda, Manaji agua be mad as a jig away siag, Benesia giguyag. Again, de de mama ye. So I wasn't um, raised in the bush. I I grew up with, with my family in a suburban area of the Twin Cities, um, but I always was connected to my Ojibwe homeland and my Ojibwe family uh, in my earliest memories and my most significant earliest memories are some of the ones that I cherish the most. And that is being right by Lake Superior, out on the Red Cliff Reservation. And Roxanne, you talked about smells. And it's that smell out there, out at Frog Bay, out at Raspberry Bay. And you cannot undo that. That is like uh, the, the recharge when I was little. And 
we had to get there and I was so excited to be there um, with my relatives who lived there and knew that country very well like the back of their hand so I was uh, very fortunate to have that experience and I cherish that still to this day and I think that's been one of the main influences of I don't know, reaching a point after high school and as college began that um, some language activists talk about this journey back to ourselves. And uh, that is definitely what had happened with um, my continued learning and um, supported growth from family and friends of reconnecting with the natural world. Um, so growing up in the suburbs, you become attuned to cycles and patterns that I think are unnatural. They're disconnected from the, the, um, the woods and the waterways and the animals and the plants that are there. And I think one of the most profound things we can do as humans is reconnect. As Anishinaabe people, that's what is most familiar with to us. And even as a human organism, all of our biology and everything is more connected to the natural world than sitting inside a house um, in offices and all that kind of thing. So I tell people, get outside. Like Ogimao Bonavik said, it, there's medicine out there. Being out with the sounds of nature and the, everything that's coming from the plants that's in the air and the, the animals that are out there that heals you and can make you strong. And um, I believe that a lot. So having that opportunity, I think, in life to kind of change my lifestyle into different patterns. So the nine to five or eight to five, whatever, Monday through Friday cycle of the schools that aren't really working for Indigenous people and haven't worked for a long time. And breaking away from that um, is really eye-opening. I think um, one of the, the greatest experiences that um, we've had in learning language and learning how to hunt and learning how to fish again um, is that you attune your senses and your consciousness to the natural cycles. And it's more harmonious, I think, when you build your life around the cycles that happen in nature. So springtime, go to sugar bush, work sugar bush. Like today, we just boiled down about 200 gallons and just finished up. So we have a big sugar bush that's going. And you learn things um, about so many life forms and plants and about life and cycles by participating in that. So, you know, and you follow those cycles through. So from Ziguan Niving to Guavig, you know, Abibung, all the way around there's something that each um, season offers in terms of um, food a chance to get your your food together um, a lot of what i've experienced with in working with indigenous people who are kind of trying to learn relearn our life ways is that we become too connected with the mainstream cycles that are disconnected from our traditional histories. And so um, it's really foreign for some of us to think that, okay, oh, I would really like to go spearing walleye sometime. And do you think it'll happen on the weekend of April the 11th? Because that's really the only time I have right now. And, uh, and after all, you know, you just have to laugh. <laughs> well, you have to go when they're spawning. They are the ones in charge. When they're ready, you just go. And so a lot of times I think it's confusing for people to try to adjust to those schedules or, oh, I'd really like to go pick wild blueberries. Well, you have to get out in the woods and you have to watch them getting ready. And when you think it's going to be, you just go and you got to do it. You got to pick up and go. But I think as for some of the people who see that is, oh, it's too unpredictable. It's too, it doesn't fit into my schedule, but it actually is predictable and it keep, it's a reliable cycle that keeps going and you can adjust to it. So I think by doing that, when you watch what happens out there, 
it teaches you a lot of patience. It te teaches you about respect. So Wase Gijik talking about those animals. And, and I remember um, duck hunting with um, Ogimao Gunevik's son, sons and her in a boat we many times and um that is a life-changing experience to be out in the rice beds everyone's speaking ojibwe you know we're we've got ducks with food to eat that day and um i think just learning about all the significance of the animals so like we say each animal has something that they treasure so much um you know, in each animal, you, you have to kind of take care of those things when you clean an animal or when you dress them. And some of those things go in the water. Some of those things go specific places or to mm -hmm. certain trees and that kind of thing. And uh, understanding the why behind that. Um, and it talks about respect and readiness and sharing and the cycles that we, um, we are so dependent on. You know, we're the last ones put here on earth. And uh, we have to respect everything ahead of us. Otherwise, we're not going to make it. And we might just very well ruin the whole, <laughs> ruin everything. But hopefully that won't happen. So I'll stop there. Mew, miigwech. Oh, wow, miigwech. We have to think about where this pandemic is going to. We may have to go back and eat, eat, the, eat off the land. <laughs> yeah, me, yeah. Oh, well, give me one of the things. Me great. Leah. Oh, wow. Um, wow. Thank you everyone for your stories and uh, sharing your teachings as well. Um, as I've mentioned in, in, in prior iterations of this uh, panel, I, I didn't grow up in our Anishinaabe ways. The first half of my life, I, I was not raised uh, in, in the language or in the teachings. Um, you know, my, my mother and my grandfather were, were not raised in, in, in these ways either. So, um, you know, as I, as I think about what I've learned the second half of my life and how it's impacted my son and how he is getting an opportunity to to access ways of living with the land and um, Oasi Yog and Benesi Wog and you know Igu Yog and all all those relatives, um, I, I I kind of feel like a, a transitional generation for him, you know, help helping for it to come back. But I I, I grew up in a hunting family and um, I grew up hunting. I grew up walking walking the woods, and similar. Um, similar to uh, Michael, when, when I hit a certain age, there was something that started to happen uh, in my heart around the hunting time. And I, I would get really sad. And I, I, I would, um, you know, for years, just uh, hide, get, get away from the woods. So I didn't have to uh, hear, you know, hear the sounds or, or, or watch what happened. But I received a teaching uh, from just an elder and a really good friend of mine, Stephanie Williams, that helped me to, to, to understand and be able to sit with um, our relationship with hunting and gathering a little bit better. better. Um, this elder um, has, ha has, has trouble with mobility and getting around because of health. She told me that she fell asleep um, near a tree during hunting season. And in her dream, um, you know, she said those Wabashke, she would spoke to her and she shared the dream with me and said, I could share this teaching as well, that um, they said, it's okay. It's okay. You know, we, we volunteered, we volunteered to give our medicine to the humans. And um, so, so this is an honor. This is an, this is a privilege to, to, to give our medicines to the Anishinaabe and to the humans. And as she woke up, as she woke up, there was uh, the Wawashkeshi in front of her and um, gifted, gifted him or herself to um, this elder's family. And so even though, you know, my, my heart has a hard time going to take a life, um, 
I know it's important to do it in the right ways, um, very similar to what Coco and Roxanne and Keller and Michael spoke about, you know, going out um, and asking permission as well as giving gratitude. So my son, even though I didn't teach him, he learned, you know, from my father to hunt. He learned how to technically hunt, but he learned how to put that tobacco out and to uh, gift and 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 treat that wawashkeshi after giving, after truly giving its life versus uh, him taking a life. I really like to uh, change that narrative of some of our Western teachings about that, that we're taking when actually they're giving, they're giving themselves to us. And um, so it was with pride, you know, that um, even though I had stepped away from the hunting, that my son could do it in a good way, in the right way. And, um, you, you know, in that same year with, he learned to, to tan hides with Majik Ash. And um, that, that following summer, he actually went out with uh, Coco's son, Pebama Benes, and learned how to net and, and how, 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 to, how to take care of those Gikuyug. Um, and so, so I know that I've um, come full circle with uh, my relationship with, with hunting and gathering and remembering uh, my place uh, in that circle, in that cycle of life. And it's, I am a part of, and I'm not taking anything. I am um, asking permission and giving gratitude. Um, I, I just wanted to share one more brief story. I know when I went out on Very Fast with uh, Kathy Hoagland and, um, you know, when Earl would, would put us out, I, I know even though it, it was only a 24 hour fast, for me, those teachings were so invaluable um, to put out our prayers um, for, for that growing season, for the berries, for the rice, for everything that came after. And um, that pathetic 24 hours that I went out, you know, went without food and water just uh, reminded me what uh, these relatives are, are, are rooted relatives and um, the four legged what, what they go through, what they go through having to deal with uh, what goes on with our seasons, with our droughts, with our, you know, with um, what, what happens. So uh, for me, that was a, a huge teaching, um, you know, to fast in the spring and to fast in the fall and to make sure that I'm, you know, uh, putting those prayers out uh, for those relatives that actively give themselves to us as humans. And I just want to give a shout out to Roxanne's cooking. I've seen and been on the other, other end of the dressing out of, of um, what she brings to the table. And it's absolutely amazing. Miigwech, Mio. Aha, miigwech. I think one of the things that um, I was, I grew up with is uh, when you put stuff back where they belong another one grows from there that it's just like us when we 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 uh disappear from here we were reborn someplace else and that's the way i understood about uh why we put the beaver bones back in the water or uh the deer bones back in the bush you know that's that's where my grandma used to say when you get a, a muskrat we ate lots of muskrat if you don't want to eat this muskrat, go through it back in the water and watch it swim away from there. Really, I really believe that. Basically, not much anyone does again. I sat there and watched for that muskrat to, to swim away from there. <laughs> I think I know today what she meant by that. Me, <laughs> Yeah, you got Me great. Mm -hmm. We'd love to hear more from you, Michael. What well, else I'm gonna... can you share with us? Oh, I got a, I got a good one. That's why I'm excited. <laughs> Around hey. here, uh, when I was, when I was uh, working at the school, I used to share what I have. Like I, I'm, 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 I'm really happy to share what I have. Like. Uh, Somebody did my uh, my taxes today for for way less money. So I uh, I did my daughter here give her a pound of rice. Thank her for doing my 
my taxes, I said. <laughs> I'd love to share. Anyway, I'm going to tell a story. Are we still on? Are we off here? Nope, we're still on. Oh, okay. That didn't, the, the picture went black. Anyway, when I, uh, when I, whenever I get a deer or, uh, or given a deer, I would, I'll do a nice smoke and I'll make pemmican. And this is when I was still trapping. And I used to share that at the band office. I'll take the pemmican. We know what the pemmican is, right? No okay, go on. Smoked meat chopped into little pieces. So I went and shared that at the band office. And, uh, and I just love to see people enjoying it. Oh, this is good. You should make this into business and sell it. And I said, no, I'm not going to sell it. I said, I, I, didn't, I didn't buy it. I said, so in the next time I went up to my trap line, I went, um, I made I made a deal with uh, I made a deal with the creator. <laughs> I put my tobacco down. I said, if you give me the meat, I'll share that with my community. And my community is uh, four or five hundred people. <laughs> so I uh, I went into the river. As soon as I got into the river, oh, there's a deer over there, but it's far away. He was already looking at me. Anyway, I'll, I'm going to take a shot at that. It's that it's going to run soon. So I took a shot. I don't know how far, but that I could see the sight anyway. A shot and the way he jumped and I knew I missed it. I even, I got off see if there's any blood, blood trails there, but no, nothing. Oh, right. I said, well, I went into the river and just hoping that maybe something else will be down there, even though I, I, I fired a big shot and all the animals might must have scared him off the river or something. Anyway, I was in there maybe an hour, maybe two hours. I turned around and, uh, well, I'm just going to go home now. Just about at the mouth of the river, I was just about almost sundown too. There was a, something there, it looked like a stump. It was way up north, no, no roads, nothing. I started thinking, hey, what's the horse doing out in the bush here or something? I don't know why I thought that. And, and I looked at it again and it turned its head, hey, that's a moose. So I shot the moose and I, I got more than what I bargained for, I think. I had a hard time getting out of there, but I fed the van office. <laughs> so I, when I put, when I made my, uh, my um, I asked the creator, if you give me the meat, I'll share it. He did give me the meat. <laughs> me, yeah, me good. <laughs> well, Dixie had to step away for a moment, so I'm just going to open it up to pass it. Coco, I... Coco, they say, watch out what we ask for, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> better, We're always better, answered. Better watch what you ask for, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I had well, to work. Don't make no promises. <laughs> yeah. I had, I had to work hard. I only had a canoe. I didn't have a boat. <laughs> so oh, I had geez. to put that meat in the canoe and bring it home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it was fun, though. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I think what's up underneath that, though. Um, when we talk about hunting and when we talk about, you know, gathering and fishing, and you know, um, there, there's a couple things up underneath there that I think are, are really relevant to us um, to talk about. And that, you know, that, that's that whole um, preciousness of life, okay? Life is so precious. And, and so when, when we know that, when we know just how precious that life is, then, then we recognize the sacredness of our food. Okay? When, when we know that we are the last ones who are placed here, our, our creator had everything, everything was here, it was beautiful, it was absolutely, you know, a reflection of that, that so beautiful place, hey, where the creator sits. Everything was, Absolutely. I mean, I can, I can almost, you know, when I, when I hear them talk about that, how, 
how life was so beautiful. You know, it was just so perfect. I can, I can almost see, you know, walking and smelling and, and feeling, you know, the earth underneath us and hearing the animals and hearing, I mean, this morning, the birds singing. Okay. Um, quick, quick side story, which is kind of connected. Eh? Um, I left, I, I went up to bad, I was just in Bad River last weekend. And um, on my way home, gosh, you know, the snow has really melted off in the field. And so um, on both sides of me on Highway 2, the fields were pretty much, you know, melted out and, and, and all of deer were out there. And, you know, and it was just about sunset. So they, they had come out and they were um, really eating in those fields. You know, I, you know, winter's been hard for them. And so they're, they're in the fields and, and there were lots. And so I'm really being attentive, you know, and yet I saw the, I saw the one leap out in front, you know, and then I saw the, the other one coming and I thought, oh no, he's not going to make it. And sure enough, the car in front of me hit that deer and it bounced underneath the car. And I pulled over and um, I, I, you know, I, I stopped and I grabbed my tobacco and I go, you know, I stopped my car and I went over and I was, I was simply going to pull him off the road and, you know, apologize to him for, you know, the hastiness of this one, not even, not even stopping, not even thinking. Hey. So I recognized right away that this one hadn't left yet. And so, you know, I, I got nothing in my car, you know, nothing to be assistive and so I thought, okay, well, then, um, then I'll wait and I'll make sure he doesn't get hit again, that at least he won't have any more pain than he's already experienced, a little point buck. And so I sat there with him and um, cars, of course, are going by because I'm in the middle of the road, you know, and cars are going by and, uh, and uh, um, you know, a couple of people stopped and I, I would ask them if they had a knife in their car or something that would, you know, help this one to leave sooner so that it wouldn't suffer so much. And, and the thing that, the thing that stood out to me was, was the look, you know, the look in his eyes. And so I would, I would sit there and I would, I would talk to him a little bit like that. And I would tell him it was okay. You know, that um, we, we appreciated everything that, that you know, that every every step that he took and every walk that he made, you know, that we appreciated him in that. Um, and and I was sorry. I was sorry that that happened, and then that it was happening this way. That I know he would have given himself if he'd had the opportunity. I mean, it was we had this whole conversation for a bit, there. and every so often he'd kick a little bit, and then he'd look at me, and as if you know, you know, help me. And so then I'd, I'd, I'd put my hand on him and I'd kind of pet him like that. And I, so I stayed with him. Well, an ambulance came and um, they were driving by and they saw me there. So the two men that were in the ambulance, they got out, they turned on the lights and they you know, guided traffic <laughs> around us. And um, they waited with me. And so at the, at the end there, um, when he was when he was finally gone, you know, um, and it was safe to pull him off the road because prior to that he was so afraid, hey, and he, he would thrash about every so often, and so we pulled him off the road, and um, I thanked them. I said thank you for thank you for helping me, and I quick got back in my car because I was sobbing, okay. and and I think you you know and I and I I had to think about this you know quite a bit because I'm I'm a couple hours from home, <laughs> I'm driving. And, and so, I, you know, I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about, you know, how we take things for granted. You know, we take things for granted. We, we have no connection to our food. And this breaks my heart. We have no connection to our food. We go into a grocery store, we go to a meat counter and we, we, we purchase packages of something. We're not even sure what that is. We're not, we have no connection to this, say. Eh? Um, <laughs> And, and the preciousness of that, of those lives is completely overlooked, completely, completely disregarded. As if those animals have no meaning other than to take care of us, you know? And, and, and we forget that that's a gift. 
And and even in that one leaving, I later realized because it you know I, I've sat with it for a bit now. And then as it happened that very next day, I was running sweat lodge, so I brought that in sweat with me to to pray about. And um, I, I I start to see the gift of that of that one's life, you know. And I'm I'm even more thankful now about that. And and went back. And, and pulled him even further off of the road into, into the bush. And, um, you know, I, I, that sometimes that just, it just breaks my heart that we have no connection. And it's, it's really tragic that somehow we have lost all connection to our food. And yet when we're out and when we're hunting and when we're gathering, there it is. There it is. Now we recognize it again. And, and for, a, for a bit, we, we see our place. And I think that this is the importance of it, eh? We see our place here in creation. And, and we see the sacredness of that gift that's provided for us in the food, in the water, in the animals, you know, in our air. In, in just the capacity to walk across the earth, you know, we see the preciousness and the sacredness of that gift, okay? We were the last ones placed here. You know, if they mo remove us, <laughs> take us out of the picture, oh, creation would return to its own balance again without us. I'm, I'm with you, Awakesh. I worry that we're, you know, that we're, kind of you know have gone too far but but i think that something like you know when we're given the opportunity to reflect and and to think about it again you know um then we see it for what it is okay and in, and it's more than just ceremonies that we do this okay it's when we're cooking and it's when we're infusing you know all the love that was given to us into that food and and we and we place that food on the ground. And when we when we offer our feast okay, for the spirit, and and we and we do these things, you know, I, I don't I don't think there are many people that I don't think understand them. Okay. As they stand at the meat counter in the grocery store and select a package of, I don't know, beef stew or something, you know, or hamburger. I think we I think we we lose that. So I, I like when we get an opportunity to talk about this and and see the real gift. Even in even in all of them, hey, we are not the providers. I think that's the biggest thing that I, I'm I'm always struck with when we do feasts, is the recognition that we are not the providers. This is all provided for us. Okay, we might be the one that that went and got that and cooked that and put it in the bowl and put it on the floor. But we are not the providers. We are not the ones. We are, we are simply and should be very humble in being the recipients because what a precious gift. Okay? Our lives are so precious and, and so too are the lives of, of those ones that give of themselves for us. You know, Uh, thank you, Roxanne, for uh, for your words. That brings to mind uh, something I just learned in Glyphwick. Uh, we had our uh, our uh, spring uh, our spring feast last week, and when we have that there at Glyphwick headquarters, we bring out all of our sacred sacred objects, and they bring they brought out a couple of staffs, and I just learned that Glyphwick has a staff that's dedicated to honor animals that have been killed on the highway. <clears throat> and on that staff, there's, there's a turtle's foot, several feathers, there, there's a tail of a mink. And that staff was assembled so that we could learn, be aware that how much damage we do to the animal world and that how we need to uh, <clears throat> humble ourselves and be more respectful. So we got that staff out there in the, uh, during the feast and 
and man, I tell you what, I was blown away that they that they had that there. I mean, here's a group of scientists that work for the tribes, but these scientists uh, are also trying to learn the Anishinaabe ways, <clears throat> so they can serve the tribes, but also learn, you know, learn from our our traditional ways as well. Yeah, so I was uh, very touched by it, by seeing that staff, and it was amazing. <clears throat> I don't really have anything else to share. I um, I, I did inherit my, my I did inherit my grandfather's thirty thirty Winchester rifle, model ninety four. And uh, you know, my dad and my grandfather both passed away now, and I got the rifle. <clears throat> and I remember the story they used to tell about that rifle. They said, you know, back in the forties, after after the uh, Great Depression. Um, they said that that 3030 Winchester is what fed the family. <clears throat> My grandfather would kill, would kill deer, squirrels, rabbits, whatever he could, because it was just no money for food back then. <clears throat> and then that rifle got passed on to my dad. And, you know, there was a story once that went around the, the dinner table about how my, uh, we, we went out uh, hunting deer in the summertime with flashlights one night, <clears throat> big flashlights. and. Uh, this activity is kind of illegal in uh, in Oklahoma, but anyway, we went anyways, and uh, and I remember my dad shooting a deer. He was holding a light in one hand and had the rifle in the other. He shot and killed the deer, and we brought it home that night and butchered it. So his nickname after that was the rifleman because he did it with one hand. <clears throat> but that same night when we were out there butchering a deer, the uh, the game warden finally drove up the driveway and parked the car, and it was about midnight. He went out and had a long talk with my grandfather. And then all of a sudden, after about 30 minutes, and he drove off. And even though it was against the law, you know, killing deer in the summertime, <clears throat> I think what that game warden saw was, was a man that was feeding his family because there were kids running around everywhere, and the teenagers and the young adults were all working to, you know, to cut up the meat and wrap it. And, uh, and it was in the middle of the night. It was at midnight. And, so I think uh, I'll never forget that warden's name. His name is Freddie Manus. I, I know he's passed on now, but <clears throat> I remember him having that quiet talk with my grandfather. And all of a sudden, he just drove off. I really respected my grandfather after that. Well, I always respected my grandfather, but a little bit more that night. I'll never forget that story. So, Naho, miigwech. Hua, miigwech. Miigwech. Aho, bangigi abigego. Gitishinta <laughs> Cababam say what to go away, Cababam, a butter what? Uguega stick as the world win no watchy, chin sawat, where we see ya. Get away, Miggy Wog. Walk shack, get the mind, go go and stack a make up a buyout. Mugi gear, a shame, say what? Me got not so much a pun me to get an abandang away, Kagi Kagi Kaganoshes, mean the boy at the Nogagi Kaganoshes. I just wanted to um, share something that, um, well, I guess it's okay to share somebody's, somebody's dream. Well, actually, I asked her if I could. This is quite a while ago. <clears throat> when we were talking about uh, the animals that, uh, that, that get run, run over by, by vehicles or whatever. We used to see um, a deer or moose drowned on the river. And, uh, the ice must have been too thin to uh, to to, uh, to walk across on it. And at that time when my, my husband was still alive, he said, the, the creator put those animals here for, the, uh, for, the, for the, the flyers or others to eat. The, he's feeding his, uh, his, his relatives like the, the seagulls and the fox or whatever else that they're gonna eat when, when they float up on, on, on the river, on the icy river. 
And then just recently, this lady shared this uh, dream dream with me that she had that uh, the deer or the animals that get the hit that gets hit on a, on a highway on a roadways that um, the same her dream was the same similar to what my my husband used to tell me that the the other the other ones the the, um, the flyers or the the four legged ones are getting fed. That's why the deer is uh, is is being being laid on the road, so that the animals, so the other uh, other species, can have food too. And I see a lot of that. It's like what you were talking about here. I've I've stopped in many places. I used to travel to Croquet quite a bit before this pandemic thing. There's a deer run over there, the deer carcass there. There's all kinds of uh, seagulls and eagles and crows and even a little uh, fox are eating off of that, off of that animal that was, uh, was hit by a car. So I guess that, that was her, her dream was uh, it happened for a reason. Somebody else is hungry. Everybody likes everybody likes to eat. So I did I just wanted to share a little bit of that. It's I think it's okay. I think these things happen for for a reason and it's a good thing that we we put our tobacco down when we see when we see these things. I've I've seen it, I've seen it quite a few deer or other things when Dover Beaver sometimes and and that was for the for the flyers to eat. I just want <clears throat> I just wanted to share that it's been reminded when they're they're talking there and it's okay we are given to have to eat these the the animals were put here for us to uh, to live off or to eat or to have the good life in my old days with my grandmother I think she might have I don't know she. She seems like when I think about her, she looks like she was about to be 200 years old. At that time, <laughs> she has pure white, her white hair. And, <clears throat> and she's always talking about that. Don't worry, these things happen. These, these animals were put on here for us to eat. They give up their lives so we, so we can eat or make, make blankets or make something out of them. So don't worry, just put your tobacco down and go put the bones back in the bush or put the bones back wherever they belong. Another one is going to form from there. So I believe that and I, I'm, I still hunt whenever I can. I'm maybe just a road hunter, not the beep beep guy. Yeah, me much. Obama. Great, Coco. Uh -huh, the floor is open. Go ahead, Leah. You're reaching for your mute button. No, were you? Well, I was going to look at the Q and A, but I wanted to share something before we move to Q and A. But Keller, I want I want to defer to you, and then I will go after you. Okay. Um, I had an opportunity to assist with a, um, a research project that was done by, um, a friend of ours, Anishinaabe person who had interviewed a number of first speakers of Ojibwe traditional people and had inquired about, um, wellness and how how wellness is linked to language Ojibwe language proficiency like how well a picture what we gaze at a we on a shinabe and what preaching it on a shinabe and and these recordings um these interviews were done in Ojibwe and um we had someone transcribe those interviews in Ojibwe and then we had other people translate those interviews and these were a variety of um, 
Ojibwe speakers from different communities spread out in Ojibwe country. And um, it, it appeared to me, you know, as I was asked to review this, this information, they said, you know, read over this, check it out and um, look for common themes that each one of them is Nasa Vishye Dajindamuwa Arongo Kichai Ag, Dajindamuwa Oenje Mino Ayang for the common threads. And so we did that. And um, there were these words that were being used and these ideas that were being conveyed that talked about wellness linked to hunting, linked to seeking and searching and harvesting and gathering. But they also linked it to knowledge seeking so when we try to find an answer to something, and I'm thinking of, you know, our advanced studies, those of us who go to college and university, go to graduate programs and that type of thing. And there's not much for us to grab onto in the way of like approaches, like epistemology frameworks and whatnot that help um, validate our existence in those spaces to pursue knowledge. And so it was so reaffirming to hear those speakers of Ojibwe, those, those first speakers, those elders say, you seek knowledge the same way that we go hunting. You wait for that. You know where you're going to find that deer. You go looking, you look for signs. You set your net. You know where to set your net in observance of the patterns and the fish and the, the way that that lake is. That's how you do it. But it was like they were saying, use that framework and learn that framework. And then you apply that to knowledge seeking in the modern day world. And man, did that make so much sense. You know, it was mind blowing. And then come to find out that other indigenous groups around the world, like the Maoris in New Zealand and Hawaiians too, who are having great success with their language programs. Um, they're, it's the same thing, the same consciousness. And again, like more validation. And I, you know, I say this not just to say, oh, this is great for all Anishinaabe people, but it's great for all people because it validates our unique ways of thinking and our connectedness to the world and to the natural environment and to be successful in our identities in today's world, you know? And, and I think that's a really profound idea. And it comes right from these first speakers who I have to say, they, they didn't go to university. They didn't go off to big schools and spend gobs of money on trying to get an education. They got it from their grandmas. And I think that's one of the best things of all too, is like grandma's house, <laughs> go with your grandma and spend time with her and your grandparents. And, it will help you and you'll be strong and you'll be a good person. So that, that was one thing about, cause we're on the topic of hunting and gathering that I thought it was unique that it relates to knowledge gathering and knowledge seeking too, about what we do and who we are. So, Miu, miigwech. Oh, wow, good day, boy. Uh-huh, miigwech. Oh, wow. Wow. I just got to say wow to all of you, to all of you. <laughs> um, you, you know, as we, as we uh, have been talking about hunting and uh, gathering, um, the last uh, few years I've been learning from the pollinators, from the, the monarchs, and in restoring their habitat uh, here in Duluth in my little, in the little yard I get to tend to. Um, and uh, a friend of mine, you know, told me how to nurture and, and create a space so they could thrive and live and, and you know, carry on for the generations. And um, I, wanted to, I wanted to give something back because I, I learned so much about resilience and um, beauty and strength and just selfless love just from watching these pollinators. And so I put out my tobacco, you know, cause I wanted to do something. I wanted to give back. 
and I put out tobacco and, and this song, this song came and I, I got help from, um, Sheila, Sheila Coughlin, who learned from your son, Dan, uh, Nancy, who learned from him the language. And so I, it's just really wild to me how all things come go back to Coco, just saying, <laughs> all things go back <laughs> to, to you somehow, some way. But yeah. um, is, it, is it okay, Coco, if I share this song? Sure. I'd love to hear. Um, so, so I, I've got lungs similar to what Roxanne would say about her 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 own singing. So, so be near your volume switch, okay? I I, I just want you to, to to be near your volume switch as I as I sing. But um, I talked to Dixie about doing this because this is one thing that I wanted to give and one thing that I wanted to share. And, you, you know, I just want to say miigwech to, to, to this uh, beautiful spirit too, you know, from the tree and from the, you know, from our um, four-legged friends that, that, that uh, allow us, allow to give us sound and song. Mm -hmm. So this song is called Memengua, and um, I'm going to do the uh, abbreviated version of the song because I don't have the lungs for this. I usually sing it with Oshki Gizik. And you know, there's that echo that happens when you're singing with a group that uh, can't happen. So it, it just that's also a beautiful teaching about the importance of needing one another to do things in a right way. So here's the abbreviated version. Um, the lyrics are memengua mikuadizi, mikuadizi about the beauty of that butterfly. Memengua mashka wasi about that strength that strength, that migratory strength, um, that they, that, you, you know, that they, that they move back and forth from north to south. Um, to see about that life, that good life, the life that they give all of us by pollinating those, those, those plants. So really, I mean, we think about our, our wawashkeishi, those deer and, and the reliance we have on the deer but also the reliance we have on those pollinators that provide the food for the deer that, that, that feed and gift us with medicine. And then the last one is Memenguaja Wenjige, about that self, about that selfless love. Really, um, that they just keep going. They keep going for that next generation. And um, this I share this with you now. Normally I stand when I sing, but I broke my leg and I was told by the docs. Do not put any weight on that leg. They casted me up today because I wasn't listening. Mm -hmm. And so, so anyway, so I'm not standing and I apologize. So again, hands on the volume button because I don't want to blow out your eardrums. Okay. Miigwech, miigwech.
Me great, yeah. What? So who's ready to follow that up? <laughs> <laughs> you, you turn. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a singer. <laughs> if only, if only. <clears throat> I do see a question in the chat, Dixie Dorman. I was going to say that. We do have a question in the chat. Uh, Coco, we'll start with you. Um, the question in the chat. Um, Coco is, do you pray before you hunt and gather? I do. Like I said, I made a deer with the creator and he gave me a deer. <laughs> I do. We always have a, a this trapping season. We do. We, we pray for everything. We honor everything. We feast everything. Even our snowshoes, our um, Everything that we're going to be using for the winter, we do the same thing for going to ricing. We honored all the stuff that we'll be using, even the rock, the, the, the sticks, the canoe. We pray for everything. We have a, a fall feast when we go hunting. Whether we're hunting or not, we always had a, we always had a fall feast. We still got, I still do a fall feast right now. Even though I'm, I'm just waiting for my grand, my grandkids to go hunting for me. So I think um, tobacco is a leader in everything we do. Tobacco works for us. Not too long ago, when I was trapping, I drove my four wheeler into the water. And way out there, nobody around. But I remember before going in the river, on the river, I put my tobacco down, which is in Kanob Mission. Somehow I got out of there. So tobacco is good to have. Miigwech. Yeah, that was my response too, as soon as I saw the question. Well, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and it is that expression of thanksgiving. It is that expression of, of um, gratitude and you know, making sure that everything is just right and taken care of just right. We don't want to bring anything in that's not good. So it really speaks to the importance of that sacredness of, of that, that animal when we hunt and those, those plants when we gather. You know, that um, even ricing, you know, I, we don't get in that boat without putting tobacco out first and addressing that water and addressing those plants. We don't you know, no matter what it is, even even the cooking and the preparation of feast. I mean, we we if we're going to be hunting, if we know that a you know a particular hunt is coming up, well, we've already feasted that animal and let it be known that um, we need your help. You know, we'll we'll use what we'll use what you give us in a good way. I think of my uncle. My uncle used to. He was really funny about his clothes. <laughs> his hunting clothes don't touch his clothes oh my god don't wash his clothes <laughs> because they had to be you know everything had to be cleaned and smudged and you know and and for him even fishing you know he always made sure that you know he would use the the lake water he never used soap on his hands and you know because he didn't want to startle those animals with with anything that wasn't meant to be Okay. He wanted he wanted it always to be um, the way it was supposed to be, and that's how he talked to us. That's the way it's supposed to be. Now I didn't understand that for a really long time. I had to hang around for years before you know I could ask the question. Well, what does that mean? You know, um, help me understand that because I, I you know it, that's just the way it was supposed to be. That's just how you did things. You know, no, you don't do it like that. That this is just the way it's supposed to be. Okay. You know, and then years later, I would hear the stories of why, 
and I would come to understand the whys. You know, I think Keller mentioned that the importance of of that story that's behind it, understanding the why. You know, that's the real epistemological piece that's so central that that's the heart of Anishinaabe is the why. You know, and and so the practice is based off of the why, why we do that. And the why is because of that sacredness, okay? the, the preciousness of that gift. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. About a year, a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, I um I didn't know too much about Zoom at that time, and uh, somebody emailed me and said, "Can you can you talk to us on Zoom?" And I I I I asked my son, "What's Zoom? What's that?" I said, and then he explained it to me, and then we we're going to see the faces of the people that you're going to Zoom with. Well, I'm not going to do it unless I, um, I got to do, I got to do a, a feast first. I got to feast my uh, my laptop or whatever I'm going to use, I said. And, and then we're going to ask those people to send us the gifts so that we can uh, talk talk to the talk to the creator with, with our gift and our tobacco. And that's exactly what they did. I didn't go on there right away. I waited for those gifts to come over the, over the, over the, over the bridge, and then a tobacco, and then, then we feasted our, um, our, our laptop, I guess. Gig is what I call it now. My my uh, my big malt machine. <laughs> so I um, I'm. I believe in doing these things that before we have to ask for permission to be, if we can do this, we had no other way. So we made a, we make amends or we apologize that we, we have to do it this way because right now it's the only way, but it's not going to be like that forever. So it's a um, feasting and acknowledging is a, I think it's good, good to remember and good to teach our kids with that. Miigwech. 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 I have a little bit to add there. Okay, there you go. Doing down now? Kidip tagus. Miigwech. So, in the question there from the Q and A about praying, yeah, I agree too. Anytime you go on the water, anytime you're out, we always did too. And then uh, spearfishing season for um, our treaty area, for Ojibwe's, is a big deal. Um, and years ago, when it really got going in the 1980s, especially down Wisconsin, um, there were a lot of protests uh, that were trying to stop Ojibwe exercising their spearfishing treaty rights. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they got borderline violent and it was a miracle that no one was killed. <laughs> and they're still very dangerous sometimes. Last year, we, you know, we had students of our school who were um, threatened and it it got extremely scary and um, terrible situation for to see people acting that way about that. Um, but we ask for protection and help, and not only for ourselves when we offer tobacco, but for there to be peace and understanding and knowledge about this, so that we can respect each other's ways. That these were things that we have, we have had, and that were reaffirmed by treaties mm -hmm. um, and that we legally carry these rights. Um, and that every night when we would go out, we would just never know, you know, you don't know who's on the shore. 
you don't know what you know shots have been fired and we're not talking like this is the riots of civil rights back in the 60s or something like that this is last year a couple years ago it happens every season um and we ask for for safety and for health for everyone native and non-native alike too to understand but that's all i wanted to add with with the um about the prayer question about honoring and respecting mm -hmm. yeah. be good All right, we have about five minutes left. <clears throat> min, min Is there anything else that you wanted us to know, Coco? Mina was Scott. Mina 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 Giki Is this she's, the last one? Yeah, she's asking if this is the last session, guys. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I really enjoy this. I, so we have I, about five minutes to. I just like to say I really enjoy it. I enjoy seeing people anything? that I have I haven't seen for a long time. You know, no. I just wanted to say I really enjoy seeing people and new people and and old people like me. And I haven't seen Keller in a long, long time. So it's nice. It's nice to see and nice to hear hear you guys. You, you guys are all doing a good job, beautiful job. Miigwech for the invitation. Miigwech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank like you. I said last time, it's like being the fly, you know, the fly on the wall. Dang, how yeah. cool is that? <laughs> Miigwech, everybody. Me, I wanted to say miigwech not only to those that I, we've sat with on the panel, but you, you know, Dixie for holding the space, Jennifer for, for holding the space, and Allison for the work you're doing for Friends of the Boundary Waters and in sharing this and in, in, you know, bringing it forward uh, to the next generation. So miigwech everybody. Yeah, miigwech to all mm -hmm. our listeners. Oh, looks like we have 30 now or something. Yeah. Lots of listeners. Miigwech, everybody. Bama. Oh. Oh. Bama. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Happy, happy to have spent this time with you. Miigwech. Miigwech. Thank you. Miigwech. Thank you all. Miigwech.